Good afternoon. The time is 5.31 p.m. on Wednesday, April 18th, 2018. And this is the public meeting of the District of Columbia State Board of Education is now called to order. The roll will now be called to determine the presence of a forum. Mr. Hayworth, please call the roll. President Williams. Here. Mr. Jacobson. Ms. Carter. Present. Ms. Wilson Phelan. Ms. Wilson Phelan. Ms. Wattenberg. Present. Dr. Woodruff. Present. Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones. Mr. Whedon. Present. Mr. Batchelor. Present. Ms. Rhodes. Ms. Rhodes. Ms. Robinson. Ms. Robinson. Madam President, you have quorum. A quorum has been determined and the State Board of it will proceed now with the business portion of the meeting. Members, we have a draft agenda before us. Are there any corrections or additions? Seeing no changes, I would entertain a motion to approve the agenda. Is there a second? Second. second. First of all, I have to entertain a motion. So moved. <laughs> Is there a second? Second. <laughs> Uh, the motion being properly moved and seconded, I will ask for the, all those in favor say yay. Aye. 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 All those opposed? The motion has been approved. Members, we have the minutes from our March 7th and April 4th working sessions before us. Are there corrections or additions to the minutes? Seeing no changes, I would entertain a motion to approve the minutes. So moved. so moved. Is there a second? Second. The motion being properly moved and seconded. I will ask for the, all those in favor say aye. Uh, aye. All those opposed? The motion has been approved. Good evening. My name is Karen Williams, Ward 7 representative and president of the State Board of Education. On behalf of the members of the District of Columbia State Board of Education, I want to welcome our guests and our viewing public to our Wednesday, April 18th public meeting. The State Board typically meets on the third Wednesday of every month here in the Old Council Chambers at 441 4th Street Northwest. I want to extend a special welcome to our newest SBOE staff member, Miguel Agrario 
Miguel joined us yesterday, and we are very pleased to have him on the team. Are you stand up? Welcome. Tonight's agenda includes ceremonial resolutions honoring the achievements of district students in the sport of skiing and the incredible work of our school-based mental health professionals and the Went Center for Loss and Healing. The State Board will hear from its sister agencies, the Department of Park and Recreation, and the D.C. Public Library on their summer activities for children and youth in the District of Columbia. We will also receive testimony related to credit recovery in the district public schools. Credit recovery provides an opportunity for students to regain credit for a course that they have previously failed. News reports have indicated that some of the city's credit recovery options may have been misused. Tonight's panel of national experts will provide a foundation of knowledge from which the State Board can work with its agency partners to develop statewide regulations and reporting to ensure that all schools are utilizing credit recovery appropriately. I am pleased to announce that the staff of the State Board of Education will be hitting the pavement again tomorrow on their third selfie tour of district schools. They have been they have an aggressive list of 20 elementary schools across the district where they'll be dropping off materials and promoting the work of the State Board and encouraging students, teachers, and parents to fill out the school report card survey that is currently open. We strongly encourage you to fill out the survey or to host an engagement session and let your voice be heard. More information can be found on the SBOE or RC website. And you can follow the selfie tour by way of Twitter or Instagram using at DCSBOE or hashtag SBOE selfie tour. I will now turn the floor over to our state superintendent, Hansel Kang, for any opening statements. Thank you, President Williams. Um, my name is Hansul Kang, and I'm the State Superintendent of Education. Um, it's good to be with you and the members of the board this evening. I wanted to provide some remarks on the recent Inspector General's report on uh, non-resident tuition and also um, speak a little bit to one of the items on tonight's agenda around credit recovery. Um, so we know that residency has been a topic of great interest and importance to this board, and we've appreciated your partnership in reviewing and approving a brand new set of regulations that were when enacted last year um, that totally overhauled uh, and provided much needed clarity and in some important foundations in this area. Um, as I think you all know, yesterday the Office of the Inspector General released a report on residency verification and the collection of non-resident tuition uh, related to DCPS and Aussie. Aussie cooperated fully in this audit by the Office of the Inspector General over the past year, and as highlighted in the report, we've already taken a number of actions that address its findings um, and have committed to doing more as well. Um, it's critical that D.C. residents have, ac have primary access, first and foremost, to D.C. schools. We must ensure that residency requirements are being upheld, and Aussie must be able to move quickly to address any potential residency fraud that may occur. Further, our systems and processes to verify residency must also be sensitive to and inclusive of the circumstances of all of our residents in the District of Columbia. Over the past two years, Aussie, along with you all, with your partnership, um, we have collectively taken a number of steps to improve residency processes. First, as you know, after an extensive period of public engagement and public comment, including an advance notice of proposed rulemaking, proposed rulemaking, and final rulemaking, we together issued final regulations on non-resident investigations um, and governing residency overall that uh, took effect on, um, that were uh, issued on March 31st, 2017, and took effect for the 17-18 school year. Um, both this board and DC Council approved those regulations. Second, um, pursuant to those regulations, as of the 17-18 school year, OSSI formally took over DCPS's investigations in addition to those for DC public charter schools. Um, third, as part of, again, those regulations, we've instituted more rigorous policies and practices for how we audit residency at the school level as part of the annual enrollment audit. And finally, we've updated the training and tools we use to prepare LEAs and schools for that residency verification process. 
Collectively, these steps have strengthened our efforts to identify non-residents, yet as the report demonstrates, more must be done, um, especially as it pertains to investigations and collection of non-resident tuition. As we acknowledge in our response to the report that is included in the appendix of the report in full, um, we acknowledge that we have not done as much as we need to in those areas, and we're committed to getting the work done um, to strengthen those, those systems and processes in time for the upcoming 18-19 school year. We're moving quickly to take those corrective steps and we do expect to have those in place by this summer. Um, in addition, we are increasing our capacity to conduct investigations at OSSI. Um, we are adding two additional full-time employees who will be additional investigators. Um, and beyond that, in the FY19 budget proposal, Mayor Bowser has included an additional $300,000 enhancement above and beyond the FTEs that we are already in the process of hiring um, to further increase OSSI's capacity to audit, investigate, and enforce residency fraud. Mm -hmm. Um, so I will continue to keep the board informed of our efforts, but I want to acknowledge uh, the report that came out this week. Um, and I'll, I'll just say again that I think that part of the discussions that we had throughout the residency regulations process was trying to find this balance um, that is not always easy be between um, ensuring the enforcement that needs to take place, given our role and our responsibility to uphold the rules that govern this, um, and to ensure that D.C. families have that, that access to the schools that, um, of course, they are entitled to, while also remaining sensitive to the wide range of circumstances circumstances that our families live in and to operating with the utmost humanity and fairness as we as we undertake this work. Um, next, um, I'll turn to credit recovery. Uh, so earlier this year, OSSI presented findings on our review of outcomes um, of attendance and graduation outcomes in DC high schools. Um, as you all know, one of the findings specifically uh, pertaining to DCPS was that uh, credit recovery was misused at most DCPS high schools and was in violation of DCPS's own LEA level policies and the DC municipal regulations specific to DCPS. Um, in particular, most DCPS high schools violated credit recovery in at least one of four ways, um, whether offering credit recovery courses to students who had not yet failed a regular instruction course, awarding credit for courses that did not meet the 120 seat hour requirement for Carnegie units, failing to enforce attendance requirements in credit recovery courses, or creating school developed credit recovery programs that did not comply with DCPS's LEA level policies. The report also stated that DC code, um, neither DC code nor DC municipal regulations outline any rules that govern the operation of credit recovery at the state level. It's clear that the Office of the State Superintendent of Education, um, with the approval of the State Board, has the authority to regulate in this area consistent with district law. And we think it's important that we come up with consistent definitions of credit recovery programs so that it's clear what they are, which types of students can access them and under what circumstances, and that um, we ensure that credit recovery programs are used as an important tool to help students stay on track for graduation and give them additional opportunities, um, but also that we uh, that they are operated in line with consistent policies and are comparable to the underlying courses that they are meant to serve as a second chance for. Um, and so they should be meaningful, rigorous, and aligned with state academic standards. Um, I'm pleased that the State Board of Education is beginning public conversations around the use and the oversight of credit recovery programs with tonight's panel, um, and we're looking forward to hearing from, from the panelists. Um, in the upcoming months, OSSI plans to work closely with the board on proposed credit recovery regulations at the state level. Um, district law requires, of course, a notice and comment period, as well as a vote by the State Board of Education, and we look forward to engaging and working with you in the weeks ahead on this pressing issue. And again, thank you all for um, initiating the conversation with tonight's panel. Residency verification and credit recovery are two complex issues facing our schools. Um, we understand the concerns of many parents and members of the public, and we acknowledge that there's still significant work to be done. However, I believe strongly that we can work and are working urgently to improve practices in both these areas, and I look forward to our continued partnership in doing this challenging but important work. Thank you. Thank you so much for your kind words. And we have a partnership that we will continue to strengthen. The State Board welcomes public participation in activities under our authority. At every public meeting, we begin with testimony from public witnesses on education-related matters. Your comments will become part of our official record. If you are a member of the public and would like to speak at a future meeting, please contact our staff by email at sboedc gov or by calling 202-741-0888. Tonight we have two witnesses, 
as I call your name, please come down to the table. Marilee Home, Marilyn Home, and Laura Fuchs. Okay, I didn't I didn't know you were here. You've been here so much, do I need to tell you that we need you have three minutes? <laughs> All right. You you can begin whenever you're ready. Thank you. All righty. Good evening, everyone. I'm Marilyn Holmes. I'm the executive director of Total Sunshine Incorporated. We're a local nonprofit and also a television show. Uh, we gather the top graduates of the city every single year. This is actually our 10th year uh, to support them and applaud them and to reward them for their diligent work. The valedictorians and salutatorians, every time I say those words, it makes me smile because I tell you, I know it's hard to get to the top of your class in our city. These young people deserve support. Total Sunshine, our 10th annual school grade reward ceremony is coming June 14th, 4 p.m. We have it all set up. Here's a picture of one of our uh, previous ceremonies. We're looking forward to gathering these young people and providing them with laptops for college. Now our school grade incentive program does many things, uh, but this is actually our signature annual event. Total Sunshine has kind of coined the medic to society. I've been a paramedic in the area for more than 20 years. Hopefully I don't look it. But either way, uh, we look forward to supporting these young people. Every single year when we have this event, I just start smiling and clapping. I'll be almost ready to cry, I tell you, when I see these young people come into the door and they have their uh, gowns on and all of their finery from graduation and they're ready to be applauded and supported and given advice for the, all the hard work that they have done. Now, supporting the young people that have done the right thing in our city is paramount. We have so many young people that are on the wrong track, but the ones that have done the right thing, the ones that have been diligent, the ones that have been persistent, the ones that you didn't have to worry about if they were coming to school or not, the ones that were upset when there were snow days, the young people that are on their way to Harvard and some of the finest places in our nation and sometimes abroad. These young people need a laptop for college. I have formed a committee and I'll tell you I'm actively recruiting for this committee because I want to make sure that we can give these 70 young people from the public and charter schools citywide laptops for college. Oh Lord, I tell you, I came back from vacation for this today, y'all. And this is so important to me. I did not want to come back to the city. I wanted to sit and drink my wine. That might be a little too much information, but I tell you, this is super much, it's like really important to me. And this being our 10th year doing this event, I'm hopeful that this year will be so much easier to uh, support these young people. Now, if people want to find out more information about our school grade incentive program, they can find us at totalsunshine.org. They can call us up on the Sunshine Line at 202-575-0462. Um, I'm really looking forward to inviting all the city leaders, every one of you, people that are proud of these young people, people that want to, uh, to support these young people. Um, just everyone, come on out and clap for our city's finest because they deserve all the applause we can give them. Thanks so much for this opportunity. I'm glad that I made it. I was running. I said, shoot, I came back, and I tell you what, I cannot miss my opportunity to speak about this. So um, my door is totally open. If you want to email me, feel free, info at totalsunshine.org. Thanks so much. Um, so I'm Laura Fuchs and I teach at H.D. Woodson and I'm the chair of the Washington Teachers Union's Committee on Political Education as well as serving on the Ward 7 Education Council and Empower DC boards. Uh, I've been in the district now for this is wrapping up my 11th year and I am very interested to hear what's going to happen today with the credit recovery um, panel um, and I'm certainly interested in hope that the board intends to follow this up with um, further investigation and broader communication with all of our stakeholders around this issue of credit recovery. Um, it is, as a teacher who puts a lot of stock into what I do in the classroom and works very hard to ensure that my students have a robust and engaging experience, um, I really care about where their credits come from and how they're awarded. And as someone who's now traveled pretty extensively throughout high schools in this city, um, in my capacity as a WT board member, I believe that te all teachers believe the same thing. And they put a lot of work into designing their course, making it relevant to their students, and then awarding them the grades that they have earned in that course. Um, and I believe that we're fundamentally undermined by the current credit recovery programs that are 
in place. Well, I don't think most kids actually want to take credit recovery courses. They are not fun. I do not think that they remotely come even close to what we're doing in our classrooms every day. Um, right now, DCPS, at least in my experience, is primarily using Edgenuity um, as their source of credit recovery, um, as their main source of credit recovery, like curriculum. Um, and I personally believe it is a substandard program and that if anyone spends any time looking at it, both in how it operates and how um, difficult it is to find out what a student's even done in that program, which I think is intentional, um, it makes it look like students have done a lot when in fact they haven't. They'll count a warm-up activity that could take like 30 seconds as an assignment. And so it could look like 40 assignments have been done, but honestly, like some of those assignments are so lower level and so easy to do that it really isn't that much work. Um, and DCPS consistently seems to push down the requirements it takes to pass credit recovery courses. And I've heard that consistently from teachers that when they want to do more or they want to hold the students to a higher standard, they're actually told no um, in an attempt to pass kids through the door. Um, so basically, I mean, I have concerns about what we're doing. Um, I don't feel like it's being properly communicated to teachers and it is meant to be recovering our courses. And so we want to know that if a student has failed our course, that they're receiving actually additional assistance, not some substandard computer program with a teacher who's teaching four different courses all at the same time. Um, it's just not fair to the students and it's not fair, I mean, to frankly our future. Thank you both for your testimony. Good luck with your program and uh, this is a question um, to Ms. Fuchs about credit recovery. So um, could you say a little bit about how students get referred to credit recovery? Is it simply anybody who fails? You wait and do, uh, does it happen at the end of a semester, at the end of a year? Who does it? So I think DCPS has changed it this year. Um, I'm not as up to speed as I normally am because I'm not teaching as many seniors as I usually do, but it used to just be if you failed and it didn't matter what reason it was that you failed that you could then go into credit recovery. And it was, I mean, if you're following the policies then you're doing it at the end of the year or you're doing it the next school year, typically. Um, in fact, no, you are doing it the next school year. Um, that's when the kids would take it. And it was open to anyone who failed. Now DCPS has changed that from what I understand. And if you failed due to absences, you no longer can take the credit recovery option, at least this kind of credit recovery option, which I do appreciate it's better to do it that way. Um, but I'm still concerned that students who, especially for courses that build on each other, like a math and an English um, and are skills-based, um, that just giving them a computer program is not necessarily the way to best make sure that they have earned that credit, even if they pass the quiz that they could take 30, 40 times, or frankly, a teacher could override the score at the end. I mean, it's not, it looks like a very like competency-based and you know progressive model, and I just do not believe that it's in fact doing that, um, especially in history. So are you able as a teacher, either you specifically or other teachers, able to sort of see what, I mean, do you know what is being assessed through the edgenuity? And can you say how it compares to sort of the city standards, say in social studies, which um, you teach? Or I mean, I think it technically hits the standards, but not in like a creative or interesting way. Um, and certainly not in a rigorous way, in a way that one would think a high school course um, would be using to demonstrate mastery. Um, this is a hard question. Can you give any example of that, sort of a, of a standard and a unrigorous way of assessing it versus what would be a rigorous way? <coughs> and I'm sorry, that's a hard thing to answer. No, off the I top, get it. Like, just like anything, I guess, obviously, there's a lot of teacher discretion that could be put into play, but I think the way the program's currently being implemented, it doesn't feel like there's much incentive to do much beyond check boxes that you've completed an assignment. So it could be that a kid, you know, is asked to write a full response to something. And just like in my class, they could write one sentence and, or they could write the full response. Um, but edgenuity pretty much counts it as complete, um, whether they wrote one sentence or, you know, a hundred. 
Um, and I think part of that is just I think that teachers are overloaded with the number of kids they're trying to get through credit recovery. And I think that's the problem. The mentality is get through. Um, but I think it's open to look at. I certainly could copy any assignment and send it along if someone's curious about a certain standard, because um, all of us have, at least at our school, have access to ingenuity. Thank you very much. Madam President, really quickly. Uh, so w one, I just want to say to Ms. Holmes, thank you for coming back to vaca from vacation and, and, and joining us. I do want to say um, that we really appreciate all that you do to pour into our graduating seniors, especially the ones who are going above and beyond. Um, and, you know, I think the impact you have, even with that, the, the, the ceremony and the gift, I think makes more of an impact than you can probably put on paper um, and probably lump into three minutes. So we do appreciate your work and, and thank you for joining us. Uh, Ms. Fuchs, I, uh, as we had our conversations around credit recovery um, and kind of how it has been misused, and I look forward, and I think many of my colleagues do to working with OSSI to, to um, establish some statewide guidance so that is done with more fidelity across the board. Um, I've heard of students at cer certain schools um, taking credit recovery courses concurrently with the with the actual course. Have you ex have you seen that in other school com or heard of that in uh, at other school communities? I have in the past. Um, I don't think I think like this year things have gotten a lot stricter, rightfully so. Um, on the use of this program um, to pass students through, and I think DCPS has. I'm not going to say clear. I mean, they've changed their kind of stated policies because there used to be multiple policies. And I think that one person would say one thing, another would say another. And that was leading to people believing that they were following policies or following directions um, and then not because kids were concurrently. Um, so I think, I think that's certainly still something that needs to be watched out for consistently because we don't want it to just be heavily enforced this year and then watch us slip back into bad behavior um, in the coming years. Um, for me, though, it really is, I think, hopefully we're having a conversation about what is our goal for credit recovery? Is it just to literally get them a credit and get them out the door? Because then if so, thumbs up. We're doing a great job. We are giving them credits. Um, but if our goal is really to try to figure out the root causes of why students aren't passing, um, especially ones that maybe are not passing multiple courses and have to not just do summer school but also do credit recovery and not all due to absences, like why aren't, we need to better address their needs. And I don't think that computer programs can often do that. Some kids might benefit from a computer program and they can do it and they can get a lot out of that experience but I think we're using it too blanketly um, and that most of our kids need a lot more in-depth and probably like kind of closer to one-on-one -on -one interactions with adults who can better figure out what they need and then give them access to the skills that they need. I think you're right thank you thank you Madam President. No questions for me? <laughs> No, again, really, thank you for coming out. I'm glad you made it, and thank you, Ms. Fuchs. I was going to say Laura. <laughs> I'm about to go get Talia. Her game just finished, so she'll be here soon. Okay. <laughs> Next on our agenda is consideration of a ceremonial resolutions. We will consider both of the ceremonial resolutions and then take a short recess to allow for presentation of the resolution to the honorees. We will begin with a resolution recognizing the dedication and hard work of the staff of the Went Center for Loss and Healing and our school-based mental health professionals. Is there a motion on the, the resolution? Second. Second. Mr. Haywood, would you read the resolution into the record? <laughs> State Board of Education ceremonial resolution to recognize the importance of school mental health professionals and grief counselors, CR 18-5. Whereas student mental health is an important priority for educators and policymakers across the District of Columbia and the nation, whereas mental health professionals, especially school counselors, social workers, and psychologists, perform an essential service for children at times of great vulnerability and need, providing direct support and interventions to students. 
Whereas the WEND Center for Loss and Healing has helped people in, the, people in the greater Washington area rebuild a sense of safety and hope after experiencing a loss, life-threatening illness, violence, or other trauma since 1975. Whereas the WEND Center provides on-site responses to schools, agencies, and other institutions following violence, trauma, and death of staff, students, and or others as well as consultation to schools, hospitals, and other institutions to design and develop programs in anticipation of traumatic events. Whereas the District of Columbia Health Education Standards recognize the need to increase awareness and reduce stigma around student mental health issues, and whereas school-based and community mental health professionals provide vital services to the students of the District of Columbia. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the State Board of Education recognizing and recognizes and honors school-based mental health professionals and the WEND Center for Loss and Healing for their significant contributions to the welfare of the district students. Thank you. Is there any discussion on the resolution? Seeing that, I would like to call the question. The motion is on approval of State Board Ceremonial Resolution 18-5. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? The motion is approved. Next on our agenda is a resolution recognizing the D.C. Public School Ski Program and this year's D.C.I.A.A. Ski Champions. I will turn to our Ward 6 representative, Joe Wheaton, to make the motion. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I'd just like to thank you for this opportunity and everyone up here for joining me tonight and recognizing the 2018 DCIA Ski Championships. Um, I think you all know I attended, and it was a great time um, had by all on the mountain. More importantly, I want to thank you for bringing some attention to this great program. It was started 43 years ago by Harold Plummer, and over, and over the years, thousands of district students have got to visit the outdoors and have learned to ski. But unless DCPS and DCIA have a change of heart, this will be the last year of the DC oh. Ski Championships. DCIA has recommended that the program become a club sport at the school level, a decision that I feel will expand the opportunity gap that so many of our students already face. I'm extremely proud of this year's championships, especially Will, who may have had the top time on the mountain this year. Um, and I'm honored to be able to introduce this resolution. Um, with that, um, so moved. Having been properly moved and seconded, Mr. Haywood, would you please read the resolution into the record? State Board of Education ceremonial resolution to recognize the DCIAA ski program, CR 18-6. Whereas in 1974, the late Harold Plummer, a physical education teacher at W. Bruce Evans Junior High School in Northeast Washington, D.C., founded the first program in the District of Columbia Public Schools to teach the sport of skiing to students in the district. Whereas the ski program expanded over the years to many DCPS elementary, middle, and high schools, and in 1991 was renamed the District of Columbia Interscholastic Athletic Association DCPS Educational Ski Program. Whereas the DCIA ski program has offered district students an opportunity to learn the sport of skiing, to gain new experiences and skills, and to compete in a supportive and inclusive environment. Whereas in 2018, over 100 students in grades 4 through 12, representing 18 schools, competed in the DCIA Ski Championships at Liberty Mountain Resort in Pennsylvania. And whereas this year's winners in their age and skill divisions included beginner Amber Williams, Shepherd Elementary School, Sophie Orlando, Hardy Middle School, Melvin Holloway, Dunbar High School, Novice, Quincy Dixon, Shepherd Elementary School, Marianella Rivas, Brightwood Elementary, uh, excuse me, Education Campus, Hiking Al Alexander, Dunbar High School. Intermediate, Francis Heron, Maury Elementary School. Xavier Norris, Stu Stuart Hobson Middle School. Robert McFarland, School Without Walls. Advanced, Will Whedon, Maury Elementary School. Anna Corey, Hardy Middle School. Edvin Lejean, School Without Walls. Now therefore, be it resolved that the DC State Board of Education congratulates all of the student participants of this year's DCIA Ski Championships for their hard work. Be it further resolved that the, State Board of the State Board honors the memory of Mr. Harold Plummer for his contributions to the District of Columbia. And be it finally resolved that the State Board recognizes and thanks program organizers Jennifer Allen, Amy De La Rosa, Jared Cobb, 
Philip Faxio, Julia James, and the many coaches of the DCIA ski program for their service to the district students. Thank you. Is there a discussion on the resolution? Yes, Mr. Weed. One additional point, Madam President. I'd like to request that the board forward this resolution after approval to DC um, PS and the council urging them with a letter urging them to continue support for the program. Okay. I think that's a wonderful idea. I was going to suggest something like that. I don't know the details of this, but I do think skiing, it is a great sport. It's a great sport to take up early. I see all the nods back there. So I really hope that um, uh, this decision can be revisited. Thank you. Thanks, Joe, for bringing it to us. We agree. We don't need a motion, but we agree as a board to do that. Yes. So move. Um, seeing, OK. so. I would like to call the question. The motion is on approval of State Board Ceremonial Resolution 18-6. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? The motion is approved. <laughs> we will now take a five minute break. If the representatives from the Wind Center and the DCPS ski program will join us in the well. The members of the board will meet you there. <coughs> the board meeting is now in recess. If the folks from the ski program could wait over here for a second, we're going to do the Went Center first and then we'll bring you up, okay?
Uh, why don't I drive for you? So if it's anything, this is a quick explanation about the key. So okay, I made this for you. Sorry, I'm sure that's <laughs> true. Now I um, and then um, no, I mean I haven't done it in a few years, which I really, really regret. See, my <coughs> my son was a big snowboarder, and so when he was um, here, no, he's off to college. We, I'd always end up we figured out how to go, which isn't enough to sort of. I'm calling the meeting back to order. The State Board is pleased to wel welcome representatives from two of our sister agencies tonight, DP DCP <laughs> Dep DCPL and DCPR come to the table at this time, but I see you're already there. <laughs> so both of you are here? There's, yeah, mm -hmm. okay. The Public Library has founded, was founded over 120 years ago by an act of Congress. A fellow independent agency, the DC Department, DCPL is managed by an executive director, Richard Hayes. I'm sorry. Hayes Gabilon, and a board of library trustees. Two of the trustees will be very familiar to SBOE members, Camille Anderson and Faith Gibson Hubbard, who are not here, by the way. At least you don't look like them. Okay. <laughs> The more than 25 branch libraries of the DC Public Library are located across the city and provide access to a host of media, books, technology, and programming. The DC Department of Parks and Recreation, a mayoral agency led by Keith Anderson, has 900 acres of park and 68 recreational facilities. This includes outdoor pools, spray parks, indoor pools, all offered with no admission fee for residents of the District of Columbia. Both DCPL and DPR have joined us tonight to share highlights with the SBOE of the activities they have planned for residents this summer. We will start with Ms. Kim Zabalt. I'm sorry, did I mess up your name too badly? You're fine, just like it looks, Zablid. <laughs> okay, of DCPL. Would you like to begin? Yeah. Great. Good evening, everyone. Thank push you for having down. DCPL. Oh. This, yeah, this been the, the top down. Oh. There you go. Okay. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Thank you for having DCPL here tonight. Um, I would like actually to begin with our Assistant Director of Youth and Family Service, Ellen Reardon, who can set the context for what we have planned this summer. Ellen is a new position so that we can be very strategic and thoughtful about how to maximize the summer programs that we put on for children throughout the district. Thank you. Um, we appreciate this opportunity. We're going to share with you one of the big changes that we made, which is uh, the structure of our summer incentive reading program. This year, we've made some significant changes. We have renamed it um, the DC Summer Challenge. So I think we have a slide that shows the new logo. Um, and the challenge is read 20 minutes a day, every day. Um, Prior to this, um, the focus was on hours read over the summer months, but what we know and what you all know as educators is that really the greatest reading gains are made with, sustain, with um, sustained practice over time. And so we have reorganized our program to align with those ideas. So um, the game board looks like the calendar where we are encouraging everyone to read intentionally every day. And we are working with our staff and external stakeholders on messaging around why. So um, I don't have to explain all this to you, but I thought it would be interesting for you to see some of the um, research messages we put together around Summer Slide um, and the facts of it, which is children learn at the same rate, but over the summer um, lose ground and that this is where summer slide and some of the achievement gap comes into play. Um, and there are things you can do about summer slide, um, but what we know is as much as 80% of reading skills gap between children from low and high socioeconomic levels come from um, this gap in opportunities during the summer. So summer is a really critical time. 
Um, and the single uh, summer activity that is most strongly and consistently related to summer learning is reading. And that's where we come in with our 20 minutes a day. And regardless of other activities, the best predictor of summer loss or summer gain is whether or not a child reads over the summer. Uh, it's just to give some messaging and underpinnings to our staff and stakeholders around why the changes, why the focus on reading every day. And the other thing that we know is that um, practice and participation over time has the greatest result. And then that's not news to any of you, but it is important, I think, for people to see that um, engaging in programming and engaging in programming every year is going to have the greatest gain. And our programming goals all align with this. We're part of the Mayor's Summer Strong um, Collective, which gathers all the resources together. We're on that committee, and our programming is in that main calendar. Um, we're putting it, the final touches on it right now. Um, but two to three special programs are put in every ward and every location. In addition, we have the same hours that we always have over the summer are more than um, approximately 1,000 public computers are still available for citizens to use. All of our um, preschool and birth to five programming still continues throughout the summer. Um, and uh, in addition, we're looking at informational programming. So we have science in the summer. We have some more formal programs. And um, we are really looking at ways that this summer challenge can be incorporated into other activities that are going on in the summer because it's so easily assimilated into other things any program can set aside those important and critical 20 minutes a day which is what we're hoping to do working with our partners yeah. since we have a few more minutes and i was told that it would be acceptable to highlight some other things going on at DC Public Library for this captive audience. Um, just wanted to give a, um, for everyone here, I hope many, I hope all of you have been to some of the great DC Public Library facilities around the city. Um, they're truly spectacular. Uh, the vast majority, I think all but two or three, have been um, newly renovated in the last 20, 10 years or are in the capital budget for renovation. These photos are highlights from our West End facility that just opened. It's our first mixed-use facility, which has um, housing on top, and then you can see this sort of gorgeous, um, very grand, um, sweeping library on the first floor. It, it's truly wonderful. It opened just a couple months ago. If you want to go to the very newest of what DC Public Library has opened, we also just opened uh, um, an interior renovation of our Palisades Library, an interior renovation of our Capitol View Library with an exterior renovation to follow. Uh, we're looking forward to the, uh, the cl new Cleveland Park Library. We'll be opening early summer, just in time for summer challenge and summer reading, which is great and um, s uh, several more in design and development. We've had our Woodridge Library open for about a year and a half, and it is going gangbusters. It is, uh, I think, more than tripled what it did before we it had um, kind of gotten this, th this beautiful makeover. So please visit the facilities, and uh, hopefully, I feel like it's something that everybody in the city knows, but then sometimes it's not necessarily true, that the MLK Library is under uh, 9th and G is right now it is it's quite a sight to be able to go inside because you can see from the basement all the way up to the sky uh, demolition de demolition is complete on the interior and we are eagerly awaiting a sort of a, let's say a summer 2020 opening so uh, only a little bit more than two years away and we know that will be a great destination for learning um, and for huge amounts of prog programmatic activity, but we're lucky to have these fabulous branch libraries to be spaces and destinations for the summer, uh, both for the next two years and um, on into the future once the MLK library opens. So please uh, check out one of those buildings, check out a new building, try to visit all 26 of, uh, of them, and uh, we look and forward read to- 20 minutes a day. And read 20 minutes a day. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> My name is uh, Temba Masamini. I'm the Deputy Director for Recreation Services for the DC Department of Parks and Recreation. Um, as uh, the President said, we have 
uh, close to 70 uh, recreation centers throughout the city. We have 11 indoor aquatic facilities. We have 19 outdoor aquatic facilities that will be opening in about six weeks. Um, uh, we have over 350 parklands that equate to about 900 green spaces, um, over 150 playgrounds, 200 plus basketball and tennis courts. Uh, we have a little bit of everything. Um, we are, we were vo are voted the, this, we were ranked number two in terms of uh, recreation amenities per capita uh, that we're very proud of. We have been uh, for a few years the fittest city in the nation. Uh, we got knocked down to number two, but we'll be getting that back this year as well. Um, so some of the things that we're going to go over just quickly, uh, we'll talk about our mission, uh, mission the amenities. I'm um, kind of introduce you guys to the agency uh, leadership team just so you can be a little bit more familiar. And I'll talk about which e what each of them uh, kind of has purview over. Uh, we'll talk about some intersections and some save the dates um, as well. Uh, our mission, you'll see it on our shirts, on everything we do is to move, grow, and be green. Um, that is our mission. That is what we want to push forward for every D.C. resident. Uh, we want people to be active. We want them to grow uh, personally. And we are very driven at being a green and sustainable organization as well. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that. So we want to promote health and wellness, like I said, uh, conserve the natural environment, and then provide universal access to parks and recreation services. Um, this, is, this is what drives us. This is what we live by. This is our mantra. Um, like I said, our, uh, in terms of just talking about our amenities, I, I spoke a, uh, a lot about our centers. Um, I'll break that down a little bit. We have about 23 fitness centers throughout the city uh, that are completely free to D.C. residents. Uh, we have 12 dog parts. We have seven senior centers. We have seven boxing programs throughout the city um, that are, are really, really, really strong, um, and we've done really well nationally. We have um, some national champions in our boxing program. Uh, we have 34 community gardens. We have 35 indoor gyms, uh, 119 ball fields. Uh, we have a skate park and four dedicated skate areas. We have an outdoor amphitheater um, and three performance areas. Uh, we have uh, two urban farms. We have one that's about to open in my home ward, Ward 7, uh, the Kelly Miller Urban Farm that we're really, really excited about. Uh, we're actually partnering with Kelly Miller, and um, the students at Kelly Miller will actually f use that farm. On the, uh, it's a part of their STEM curriculum. Uh, they'll be actually working the farm. We're really, really excited about the urban agriculture uh, element to that. Um, our director, as you said, is Keith Anderson. Um, our chief of staff is Jason Eukenberg. Um, I'm Timber Massimini. I have purview over recreation services. What that means is I have overview of all of our recreation centers, all of our parkland, all of our aquatic centers, and our programming. So everything that you see is me. <laughs> um, Quelly Sneed is our deputy director for administrative services. Uh, she oversees our IT department. Uh, she also oversees our um, human resources and our support services, our warehouse, and our transportation fleet. We have our own internal transportation fleet. Um, John Stokes is our community. He's our deputy director of community outreach and communications. He has our community outreach department, which includes our roving leaders um, and also our communications team. Uh, which is expanded and, and, and we're really excited about some of the things that our communication team. He also has oversight over our tennis, our citywide tennis programs. So kind of our intersections. Um, one of the things that we did last year uh, uh, within DPR, so I'm not sure how familiar you guys are, but there's a nationwide shortage of lifeguards, right? And, and the aquatics in general um, is a really good, sustainable, uh, career or entry-level career. Our lifeguards are first responders, um, and we're actually working now with FEMS to create a partnership where our lifeguards will be able to transition um, into their cadet program. So one of the things that we, we realized that we just weren't having a hard time, everybody around the nation was having a hard time finding lifeguards. We have to hire about 200 lifeguards every summer. Um, we actually hire about 500 uh, folks in the summer. We actually double our, um, we, we double the number of FTEs each summer f to, to manage our summer programs. Uh, so we, st we, so we worked with DCPS and we created a lifeguard academy in the five DCPS pools that we managed during the course of the day. So DCPS had a really big push towards swimming uh, when they opened a lot of their new renovated schools. Um, we, have, we managed the pools at Dunbar Senior High School, Cardoza, Roosevelt, um, H.D. Woodson, and Baloo. 
Um, so what we have also there is lifeguard training certifications uh, that go on in those schools. So those kids that are learning how to swim, uh, they go through that program, um, and then we give them an opportunity where if they certify, we guarantee them summer employment. Um, they're allowed to work 40 hours a week. We pay our lifeguards about $15 an hour, um, and it gives them a really good, solid opportunity to kind of understand what, you know, what working looks like. Um, and then one of the things that we've been able to do also is take a select number of students and be able to also employ them part-time during the school year. Um, with that, we are very specific about how we do that. Um, we need to get, we get permission essentially from the, the principals. The students have to, you know, the attendance has to be right, the, the behavior has to be right, um, and their achievement in the building has to be right before uh, we, we, we look to take them in. Um, but that's one of the, the things that we're really, really proud about. We were able to certify close to 100 lifeguards last year, um, and we look to duplicate that as well. Now, those courses aren't just for D.C. high school students. They are for D.C. residents, um, and they're free for D.C. residents. It's about $150 if you're not a resident uh, to take the course. It's a national certification that lasts one year, and then after that one year is up, we will actually pay for recertification. Um, what we also have been able to deliver is um, we have a very strong environmental program um, and with our environmental program, most of their programming is geared around um, environmental education classes. There has been an expansion in Ward 7 and 8 in terms of our youth environmental programming. Um, in that, uh, we have some STEM camps that also we've been able to do uh, during um, the break time and then also over the summer we have STEM specific camps. We have a little engineers camp. Um, that we have started that is actually very, very popular amongst our summer, um, our summer camp role. We are a feeding site. We are, I mean, we are the largest feeding site, thanks to ASI. I think they know, um, in partnership with ASI. Uh, we are the largest uh, feeding, we have the, the most amount of feeding sites in the city. Um, and our feeding is, is 12 months out of the year, so we do after school feeding at, at many of our rec centers. And then we expand to uh, have several hundred sites throughout the summer as well. Uh, we have what's called Destination DPR. This is something that our, it was a vision of our director to be able to show students, to show children uh, from the city who might not have opportunities, both, chil both children and seniors, who might not have the opportunity to, to travel and see different things. Um, we've, taken, uh, uh, we've taken students on fishing trips to, um, we went to Hampton, Virginia. We, they've been to Cape Cod. Uh, we just took a group of seniors to see Denzel Washington on uh, on Broadway uh, about a week and a half ago. Absolutely loved it. We have a few more trips coming up uh, this summer. Um, it's been a very, very popular uh, program, uh, especially amongst our seniors and our younger kids. Um, and then we have, you know, athletic sports exercise opportunities all throughout the summer. Um, our, one of our big focuses this summer has been to get D.C. residents as healthy as possible. Um, we have more than 150 fitness free, free, fitness classes um, available all throughout the city and we'll be adding on to that. We have a program, uh, we have a grant with the National Recreation and Parks Association called Troops for Fitness where we're actually looking to hire veterans to be able to, to deliver all types of fitness, health and fitness courses throughout the summer. So we'll be activating a lot of our small parks uh, where we'll be doing early morning fitness. We'll also be doing evening fitness as well. Um, we have some key partnerships, uh, both with the, uh, the Department of Health. Uh, DCPS is a, is, a, is, a, is a very strong partner of ours, um, charter schools, and then uh, just a host of different community organizations. I uh, spoke a little bit about our summer meals. Uh, we also um, are a hypo, hypo and hyperthermia sites, emergency sites um, uh, throughout the city. I think we have about five. Um, for summer youth employment, we take on 1,300 students um, every summer, <laughs> which, is, which is a load. Um, but we, we take them on, and, and they are assistant uh, f camp facilitators. Um, they do wonderful jobs throughout, uh, throughout our camp systems. Uh, some of our key programs that you guys might need to be aware of, or if you haven't been aware of, and I'm sorry, I'm running a little late. So our roving leaders, um, you've heard about them this summer. They host about 92 different community events throughout the city, specifically in partnership with Safer Stronger, um, uh, the Safer Stronger partnership with the mayor's office. Um, we have our young ladies on the rise and our young men future leaders, which is our preteen youth development leadership courses. Uh, I spoke a little bit about Destination DPR. 
um, and about SYP. Um, we have begun to, to shift what our computer labs look like. Computer labs as a whole are outdated. Uh, what we're doing is moving towards tech lounges, which is much more of a coffee house kind of feel. We have about four or five uh, computers. We have game systems and couches. We've intensified our Wi-Fi. Uh, we did that at three sites. We're expanding to eight more um, this year. Quick couple save the dates. Um, Saturday and Sunday, April 21st and 22nd this week. Uh, this weekend, we have our Earth Day uh, plogging, which is just picking up litter while you're jogging. I like, I, I, I thought it was cute too. Um, on Tuesday, May 4th, we have our annual teen conference. It's called Law and Order. It's really about understanding your rights um, and being able to, to, to function in a world that has been a little bit tense lately. Um, on Saturday, May 5th, we are, is our, it's our delayed grand opening for our brand new Marvin Gaye Recreation Center. Um, we'll have a 5K and it's a grand reopening. Um, it's a beautiful facility that was actually going to be, um, it's going to be featured in Architectural Digest. Um, it is, I, I challenge you, it is a gorgeous facility. It makes you rethink what rec centers uh, can be. Um, on Saturday, May 12th, we have our Mother's Day 5K. Uh, the big day for us is um, Memorial Day weekend, where Friday, May 25th, we open up our 2019 outdoor pools. Um, and then our rec day, which is our big celebration where we kind of pull out all the stops for our residents, is going to be on September 29th. All of these um, events you can find at dpr.events, um, along with a, a slew of other one-day kind of fitness events um, that we have through our Fit DC um, uh, through our Fit DC program as well. If at all anybody ever wants to get involved, a partner or uh, with DPR, this is the person that you need to call. Her name is Rose Green Colby. She is our director for our Partnerships and Development Office. Um, it's rose.green slash Colby at dc.gov. Um, she is the best person uh, for you to be, for anyone to be able to talk to about partnerships or, um, or also volunteers as well. We've expanded our volunteer uh, program to include all of DC area high schools as well to help um, our students be able to get all of their community service hours. Thank Sorry you I went both. over. Um, before you go, are there any members from our, any questions from our members? Of course, Marcus. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Madam President, and thank you all for joining us this evening. Very quickly, I just want to say that um, I'm very excited to hear uh, all that DC Public Libraries is doing. Obviously, I believe there's three in Ward Eight. I hope I'm getting that number right. Yeah, I think that's right. I so, think. Yeah. Yeah, that would be Anna Costia, Bellevue, and Parkland. Yeah. Uh, Francis Gregory's right on the board. I That's think right. it's yeah. seven. Yeah. So, so I, there's amazing programming happening uh, in all those libraries, and obviously I'm really excited about the Books from Birth program, which I guess is about two years old now. But for, for young people, especially in communities like mine, just having access to books is really the key to, to building their literacy skills. So thank you for all your work. I really uh, just had a couple questions for DPR. Um, one is about, um, you talked about kind of the school-based pools uh, that you have, um, and I, I've heard, um, I think there's a deep desire, especially around Baloo High School, I knew, right? I, I knew that was coming from you. Uh, yeah, <laughs> around, around community access uh, to the pool. I've heard, you know, the Senior Wellness Center wants to engage Baloo, and obviously the neighbors want to use the pool and the mm -hmm. track and all of those things. Have we kind of worked out how DPR so, could really increase access? So I'm glad that you asked that, so I can be clear about what our relationship is there. Yeah. So DCPS essentially contracts us to manage their pools during the school day, right? Except for Dunbar and H.D. Woodson. Dunbar and H.D. Woodson, we actually have access to operate during our public hours. Those are the only two schools that we have the ability to open from 6 to 8.30, and then we close down at 8.30, and then we open again from 4 to 9. We do not have any ability to open Baloo or Roosevelt or, Card or Cardoza um, outside of the, the MOU that we have with DCPS that allows us to operate from 8.30 to 3.30. Any decision for public, for public access has to come, has to be initiated with DCPS, and then that's a whole different discussion because now you're talking about budgetary implications around FTEs that are needed to operate there. So that is, I know what happens oftentimes, and I know you've heard it from, I'm sure, the ANC, 
I, I, I know coach, um, <laughs> is, hey, DCP, DPR runs this, and why can't we have access? We, don't, we are contracted to provide safety responsibilities from 8.30 to 3.30. That's a DCPS decision. Okay. And it also comes with budgetary implications because now you're talking, I need another six to seven employees actually eight employees yeah. to be able to do that okay and we also have a indoor facility less than a mile away that's right okay at fairby hope appreciate it no that's a really important distinction i appreciate that and and i guess the next part would would be um i th you know there are a lot of great programs happening in dpr um and i think a lot of our residents enjoy it the only distinction i mean the the i think the only um issue that some folks have is that some, at least at some of our recreation centers, just to gain access to the center, you have to be a part of a specific program. That's not true. Um, oh, I, I know this is what I've heard at maybe one or two rec centers, that if you're not, if your kid's not in a program, you know, there, there shouldn't be. And, and I think at least at a couple, there's been issues with just kids wanting to come in and play basketball or do okay. some of those things. And I think for some rec centers, there's been less opportunity for like drop-in hours, just kind of free play. Um, so, what I want you to do is combat that misinformation. Those, those are alternative facts. Um, our doors are open all the time. Now, what happens is our gyms are sometimes permitted out, or they're used by our programs, right? So, if we have, you have, a, you might have a center like, say, Berry Farm, right? And if Berry Farm has, if if it's basketball season and they have basketball teams, then they're going to get first preference for the gym. So it's very feasible that from five o'clock to eight thirty. The gym is for basketball okay. practice. So what we try to do is we do our best to be able to keep some type of public hours. Um, but what we know is that with the, the explosion of charter schools in the city and no gym space for a lot of those charter schools, we are the gym space. We are the, the home court. We are the, the game sites for a lot of charter schools. Uh, we are also, we have, we had more than 70 basketball teams in our league this year. Not just DPR-based teams, but charter schools who decided they wanted to enter their kids into, into our league as well. Um, so it's very, very difficult to get public hours at least Monday through Friday um, at a lot of our spaces during basketball season. Um, what we try to do, though, is we, we, we do our best to still trying to find time for the community, um, but it's important to, like, we, we are we are a program driven organization uh, so when we have programs they're going to have first dibs essentially on the space but anybody can come in at any time and use any space the only spaces that where they, they come with um uh they come with a, a little bit of pause is our fitness centers you have to be 18 or you can be 16 if you are accompanied by a parent um, and our boxing spaces. We do not allow people into our boxing spaces unless they are a part of that program or accompanied by the, the, um, the folks who run the boxing, just because that's a safety sensitive issue as well. Okay. But please let them know, they can come in anytime, anytime. We actually encourage folks. We had 2.4 million uh, visits last year. We're looking to get to three this year. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Yes, Ashley. Uh, thank you guys both for your updates tonight. Uh, really quickly, I did have a quick question for DPR. You talked a lot about your, or you mentioned your community interactions with um, organizations and DCPS. Could you just uh, update the board on specifically uh, Kingman Island and its intersection with DPR and DCPS? It's one of my favorite places. So I can't speak for DCPS. What I, what I can speak with Kingman Island, um, so Kingman Island has been one of those places that has, um, folks have been really worried about who owns the space, right? I know DMGEO. Living Classroom. Had it. So Living Classroom essentially is a contractor um, that DMGEO uh, contracted to be able to, to provide urban, um, urban agricultural education there. Uh, we work with, limit, with Living Classrooms as well. Um, and now it looks like we're going to be actually taking a little more ownership of Kingman Island. Um, so our environmental program, our environmental department will work a little bit closer uh, with uh, Living Classroom. We're going to be doing some things this summer with some of our summer camps um, that will actually be doing some, some nature-based stuff on Kingman Island as well. And we're going to be looking to expand our programming in that space um, in going into next fiscal year. Um, this is, we're just now kind of ironing out who has 
who uh, who is who owns the space, who has you know primacy. Um, so so what we're looking now as we're kind of getting a, a more clear understanding, we are looking to expand our environmental programming on Kingman Island. Kingman Island is is a is a it's a it's a it's a treasure that people don't really understand that it's right under your nose. Like most people, if you live in War 7, you drive by it every day. I agree. Um, and if there's anything I can do personally, I am a strong advocate of the island. I'm a local who is there quite frequently. I've tried to work with living classrooms in the past. And if there's anything personally that I can do, please let me know. Thank you very much. I will. Just very quickly. Um, I just want to say to the library folks, thank you very much. It's all music to my heart as a big reader. And to the DPR folks, I just wanted to say I've never heard in a single presentation more examples of programs that did two or three things at once. I mean, keeping the pools open, training lifeguards, et cetera. And, but my favorite is the jogging while picking up the litter. I, I just, <laughs> you just get Logging so much again. for that. So. Thank you very much. Yeah. Laura? I just echo my appreciation for your time this evening. And I had a question for the library folks. Um, I'm wondering how you've incorporated some of the findings from behavioral science in, in terms of thinking about the reading program. If you, and if you, if you know what I mean, so for example, you know, we continue to invest in this city in putting signs on buses, and most of the evidence points to those being totally a waste of money because it doesn't change behavior. Um, what does change behavior is personalized communication that is usually socialized. So when if you s tell a parent, do you know your neighbors are reading three times this week, it's more likely to influence their behavior associated with reading with their kids than if you just say, read. Um, I'm wondering how you've incorporated that in launching this campaign. Right, so that's an excellent question. What we really tried to focus on this year with the change is engagement, which is exactly that, which is relationship based at the library branch level. So what it's really about is creating that positive relationship with the library. And the reading 20 minutes a day is in the broadest sense. Mm -hmm. So we're really looking at reading in all its forms, in all its ways, and trying to meet people and families where they are. It starts with that positive relationship. And then we build on the positive relationship and feeling good about where you are. So it's behavioral first and, and reading second, if you will, as a, as a mechanism to feel more positive about the experience rather than just an out of context or as part of school, which mm -hmm. sometimes is not what everyone wants to think about in summer. Well, and some of the alternate, um, yeah. And Ellen's described just some of the alternate ways, like we, we might think, okay, reading, it has to be a chapter book of this length and it has to be of this kind of quality, but right. just, I mean, scanning through your phone that's reading um, what are some of you've had a bunch that kind right. of changed my perspective on what right so there's there's re so graphic novels are one of the things that really changed the face of reading particularly for middle school kids and reluctant readers reading online they read game instructions you read menus you read recipes you read instructions so we're trying to think about ways that we can incorporate that in our programming so that maybe some of the steps to some of the programs are printed or read together um, are there um, are there audio books playing um, in places where meals are served? These sorts of things, so that there are intentional um, opportunities to engage in reading in all the ways that people do. And do you connect with DCPS or any of our other educational institutions in terms of pulling together recommendations? So, for example. Not all reading is equivalent in terms of what it does to the brain and how it helps our kids learn. And so I'm curious about how you all have connected with like the literacy specialists at, at DCPS. Right, so we do work with DCPS, but there's a real difference in our mission in summertime and the way that we're looking at reading motivation, and it's different from formal education. It's in service to formal education, of course, in the aspirational level, but it's really quite a different animal. It deals more with the intrinsic motivation and reading choice. So while we are sensitive to this idea that formal education and reading improvement comes at, um, there's a certain formality to it in terms of grade level and leveled reading and reading at grade level. In summer, we're really looking at something different. 
um, and it's really more studies um, actually about free choice and what people choose to read and how they choose to read is part of developing the reading habit, and particularly when you're dealing with reluctant readers. So it's going to work on a couple different levels. Um, when you're really working with reluctant readers where you're trying to encourage that intrinsic motivation, it's a slightly different path. Thank you. So thank you all um, for being here. Um, just a couple of quick things for our friends at DPR. I had a conversation earlier this week with um, some representatives at the American Heart Association, and they've got a couple of programs that may fit with what you're trying to do, and I'd love to make some connections for you. Um, they've got a Cooking with Heart program that they would love to bring into the communities to help people understand how to cook healthier and simpler. Um, and then they also have a blood pressure program, um, check change and control blood pressure that they use students and are working, um, asked me to reach out to some of our health academy students to see if they can get volunteers that come into the community. But I think a lot of what you do may be a perfect venue for these types of programs. And then I just put a plug in, a number of our students, including um, Eastern High School students in my ward that go through their health and medical sciences academies um, are certified as CP in CPR. Um, at Eastern, we're also getting um, students certified in EMT training. Those would be perfect students to recruit into your program, and I'd love to see some additional bridges built there. And again, I'm happy to make connections, and I'm sure you have them as well, but the more that we can do to engage and support our students in these opportunities, the better we're, we are as a city. I, I, I love those connections. I've, I have a very good relationship with Principal Brown over at Eastern, so I, I absolutely love it, and we, we welcome every student that we can get. Uh, I want to thank you. Uh, this is, it's been a pleasure hearing both from the libraries and DVR. Uh, I have two quick questions. First with the library, in regards to the 20 minutes a day, um, I love that, that, that the fact that you are, you're moving in that direction where that should be something that is discussed and talked about. One of the things that, um, I see that has worked in other states where I, my children have been involved with the library is that within that 20 minutes a day, they had to write down um, some of the key words they heard, new words they learned, so that that was a part of that 20 minutes mm -hmm. that made them use their mind a little differently because they were introducing themselves to new words. And it also helped engage them more with that 20 minute read. And so, um, Within your 20-minute read, do you have any guidelines where uh, it's encouraging uh, families or and children to engage in what they're reading? Yes, I mean that would be the um, that would be inherent in the reading together. I mean, one of the things that's wonderful about this program is it really does we encourage the entire family. So it's for adults, it's for little guys who don't read yet to be read to. It's big kids reading to little kids. So the messaging is very simple, but we're really working with our staff to have that next level of engagement with families around really the pleasures of reading and what it can bring. So it happens in all different ways and all different kinds of situations. Yes, thank you. Um, moving on to DPR, first I'd like to thank you all. With I worked with the out of school program at one point, and DPR was like a blessing in regards to their swim programs, and I was able to connect with um, the school and DPR swim programs so that we can teach children to swim, which I thought was just awesome, considering that there were more than one program going on at the school that I was working with. Um, but my question is, is that um, in regards to the community gardens that you all have um, throughout the parks, are the community gardens that are located within the community, are they those little square blocks you see of gardens, is that part of DPR as well? Yeah. So. There are a few different organizations that have community gardens. All of our gardens will be marked with one of our green signs mm -hmm. uh, where it will be named. It will say D.C. Department of Parks and Recreation. We have 32, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, they, they are mixed into the community. They're, they're, they're everywhere. Um, nice. But it will always be marked with a DPR sign if it's ours. Because I know UDC has a bunch as well. 
Oh, I see. Um, so it's mm -hmm. not every single community garden that you see in the city is ours. A lot of them are, but ours are very clearly distinguished. And the ones that have food growing in them? Yes. Do, do, so our, ours okay. do have people are doing urban farming um, in, in their plots. So they're growing vegetables, uh, some fruit. Um, yep, that, that's, that's us. It does exist. And how do you get a piece of that garden? So, <laughs> Sorry. So our plots, are, our plots are popular. <laughs> um, what you can do is you can contact our, our community gardens. Uh, you, you can call our main line. Um, I don't, it's on 671, I forgot what it is. I'm sorry, I, I should know that. <laughs> um, uh, but if you call our main line and just ask to, to, to speak to our environmental programs division, um, our environmental programs manager is, her name is Erica Carlson, Erica Carlson. Um, and we have two uh, community garden specialists, Josh Singer and Kimari Norman. Um, you can contact any of them. They can, they can tell you what that waiting process looks like. Mm -hmm. um, we, we do apply every year. Oh. Um, so we are looking to open a few more urban spaces. Um, and so Shepherd, I believe, will have something to work for uh, when, we do, when we do the new Shepherd um, Recreation Center. Uh, we have a few that will have, oh, I'm sorry, I'm all, I'm, I, I get excited. You see, I get excited when I talk about it. I'm sorry, I'm talking too much. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just want to say that you guys are doing great work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I really want to thank you all for coming. It's very informative. And I want you to know that my first job was a lifeguard for DPR. See? So, um, Listen, no, I don't think on. so. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think so. But um, <laughs> thank you for it. <laughs> um, but this has been very interesting and informative. And uh, you're welcome here anytime. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. For a number of years, schools in the District of Columbia had utilized different strategies to ensure the students who have failed a class have the opportunity to redo coursework or retake that course through alternative means, thereby avoiding a failing grade on their transcripts and earning academic credit. These strategies are generally known as credit recovery. Regulations regarded to graduation requirements and awarding credit fall under the approval of the State Board and thus so does credit recovery. Tonight's panel discussion will provide board members with the, and the viewing public with a wealth of information about credit recovery programs in other states and city. This information will be used by the board when it considers potential regulations in the coming months. The State Board believes public discussion is vital to the ultimate successful implementation of new policies and regulations. Jennifer Zent is the High School and STEM Director at the Education Commission of the States, and Dr. Jordan Rickles is Principal Researcher at the American Institutes for Research. If you both would come down to the table, uh, SOB e staff will pull up your presentation. Please note that you must use your microphone. Your microphones are ready, already on and ready. Members, we have two rounds of questions for these witnesses once their presentations have concluded. Please begin when you're ready and welcome. So uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak to you this evening about credit recovery. Um, before I jump into the, the study that I wanna talk to you about uh, this evening, I'd like to kind of briefly just go through uh, what credit recovery is or kind of what it can be based on our experiences studying credit recovery. So you know, credit recovery can broadly be defined as any opportunity a student has to retake a course after they've failed it. Um, beyond that general definition, credit recovery classes could look very different from one district to the next or from even one school to another school. Um, so to think about how credit recovery courses might differ uh, it's helpful to consider uh, three characteristics uh, of a course. So the first one is how is, instruction how is instruction delivered? And so for delivery, the course could have your traditional teacher-directed instruction or what's considered face-to-face -face instruction. Uh, or the course could be an online course where the student receives instruction directly through some online platform. Um, or the course could be a combination of the two where you, where you have 
um, an online um, platform as well as a teacher in the class providing instruction, and we typ typically refer to that as a blended learning model. Uh, for PACE, you could have a more traditional course where the teacher sets the pace of the course, um, typically based on some kind of whole class instruction, and there is typically a required number of hours of instruction or, or a seat time requirement. Um, or the course could be designed so that students go through the course at their own pace, where, for example, some students can quickly um, complete a te or test out of specific content that they've already mastered, and then spend more time on the content that they struggled with um, when they took the course for the first time. When it comes to um, defining completion or whether a student actually recovers the credit, um, that could be based on a standard approach to grading, um, you know, where it's based on tests, homework assignments, and other factors that teacher takes into account. Um, or it could be based on the student passing specific tests or completing specific projects that demonstrate mastery. So that's just kind of to give an overview of ways to think about how credit recovery courses can differ um, from one, one course to the next. And, and now I'd like to turn to um, a specific course that, that we did a study on in, in Chicago. And so this study was designed to test how well students do in an online Algebra 1B course, or kind of the second semester of, of the first year of Algebra. And we compared how students did in this online course to how other students did in kind of the face-to-face, -face more traditional course. It took place um, during the summer in Chicago public schools, and we focused on ninth graders who had just taken the class during ni their ninth grade year and failed and are looking to recover the credit over the summer before their 10th grade year. Uh, for the online course, we used a specific online program that the district was interested in at the time. And for both the online and the face-to-face -face class, um, students were taking it at the high school. And the online class included both the online instructor as well as an in-class mentor. So this is um, one of the most rigorous studies of online credit recovery that we're aware of, um, mainly because we used a randomized or lottery-based design um, so that we had some confidence that the differences in um, outcomes that we saw between the online students and the face-to-face -face students um, could actually be attributed to the different courses that they took and not to kind of pre-existing differences of the students that generally ch choose to take these courses. And we looked at a number of outcomes, including student experiences in the class, their grades, um, the passing rates, a score on an end of course assessment. And then we also followed the students through their fourth year of high school uh, to see how many math credits they acquired and essentially whether they graduated on time or not. Our main finding from the study is that students in the online course did a little worse in the short run uh, than students in the face-to-face -face course and did about the same um, later in high school. So as an example, on the left of your screen, um, we show in the short run, online students had lower scores on an end of course test on average, and students were less likely to pass um, the course. So on the graph, that 66% of online students passed the credit recovery course, uh, whereas 76% of the face-to-face -face students passed the course. And after their fourth year of high school, um, the online and face-to-face -face students had accumulated essentially the same number of math course credits and had nearly identical high school graduation rates of 47 percent. Um, what we wanted to do is we looked more closely at the students who needed to retake Algebra I um, after their ninth grade year, and we found that most students had severe academic deficits and showed signs of school dis disengagement um, in the ninth grade year. So as an example, 56% of students who failed Algebra I had missed 30 or more days of school during their ninth grade year, um, whereas students who passed Algebra I, only 14% of those students missed you know, 30 or more days. And looking at the number of courses students failed in their ninth grade year, um, half of the students who failed Algebra I had actually failed five or more um, 
courses, semester credit courses. And if you look at students who passed Algebra 1, less than 2% of those students failed that many courses during the year. And so these deficits are important to consider when planning credit recovery options uh, because they indicate that students who need credit recovery need a lot more than just taking a single class um, to get re-engaged in school and get back on track. When we look at how students in the online course did when their in-class mentor provided instructional support, we found that credit recovery rates were about the same in the online and face-to-face -face course when the in-class mentor provided some instructional support. So while our overall findings are that students in the online course did a little worse in terms of um, passing the course and getting credit than the face-to-face -face students, when we look specifically at online classes where we saw that the mentor was providing some instructional support, we saw kind of a, a bump up in, in, the, in the passing rates. And so this raises a question about whether a blended learning model where an in-class teacher can support the online learning um, would be a more effective approach. And this is something we're trying to look at uh, more closely now and in a study where we're just getting up and running. And so I'd just like to conclude with, um, sorry, checking the time. Just like to conclude with uh, some issues to consider when thinking about credit recovery. Uh, first, there's a question about how to balance the trade-offs between remediation and rigor. Uh, to complete a course, you want students to master the content standards for that course, but many of these students who need credit recovery won't be able to master the course content until other academic deficits are addressed. And, you know, for example, it's hard for a student to master Algebra 1 if he, she or he really doesn't have a good grasp of fractions yet. Um, but the more time a course spends on the foundational instruction takes away time for the actual content of the course. And second, there's a question about how to allow flexibility in credit recovery approaches and ensure, and ensure high quality instruction at the same time. And so we know there's lots of credit recovery models out there uh, and schools will generally implement them however they kind of see um, fit, kind of adding their own twists or even, you know, creating their own homegrown approaches to credit recovery. And so to figure out what works and what doesn't, um, it's important to understand the different ways credit recovery are actually used across schools and to have a clear set of learning objectives and outcome measures for the courses, um, like some kind of common end of course um, exam or test. And that would allow us to better understand um, whether students are meeting the learning object objectives for the course and help us determine what works and what doesn't. And so third is the idea of incorporating credit recovery into a more comprehensive system of supports. Um, as we described in Chicago, uh, students who need credit recovery need a lot more than just this one credit recovery course. And so students will probably have a better chance of success if credit recovery is combined with other interventions and supports and that address school engagement and remediation. And better yet, um, trying to find ways to reduce the need for credit recovery by identifying and promoting more proactive interventions and supports that improve initial course performance. And so with that, um, again, I'd just like to thank you once more, and I'm happy to try to answer any questions you have. We'll get to that after the second presentation. Thank you. Oops. One second, please. The presentation uh, came off the back. Okay. No problem. Paul, can you make sure the cord yeah. is back? Okay. Well, I'm just Good evening. It's a pleasure to be with you tonight. I'm Jennifer Zinth from Education Commission of the States, and uh, I was hoping to talk to you a little bit about credit recovery and what we're seeing nationally in, in terms of state policies and some issues to consider. Uh, just a word before I begin my presentation, uh, Education Commission of the States, based in Denver, Colorado, is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization serving education policymakers across role groups across 50 states. So in addition to state boards of education, we serve governor's offices, state legislatures, state superintendents, higher education officials and boards, and so on. 
And so this graphic is here intended to um, show that we uh, look at education issues from the earliest years through post-secondary in the workforce. And in my work and as director of high school in STEM, under high school, I look at a number of issues, including graduation requirements and assessments, dual enrollment, AP, and so on. And so we're a nonpartisan organization. Uh, we provide unbiased information and opportunities for collaboration. We don't take sides on issues. We don't lobby. We're a 501c3, but we provide this, here's what it is, here what, here what states are doing, here are considerations, and then put that information into the hands of policymakers like yourselves to make informed decisions. We provide several different types of services. Um, council is what I'm doing here tonight, but we also have a number of reports on our website. We do customized research on a daily basis. If state boards or others have questions, they'd like to know what other states are doing, what the trends and best practices lessons learned are. And so just to provide a little bit of context setting at the beginning of the presentation, uh, just to be frank with you, very few states have statewide credit recovery policies. And of those that do, they are what I would refer to as opt-in, where it's not every LEA must have a credit recovery policy. But if an LEA should choose to have credit recovery, these are the components that must be addressed through that program. However, looking at policies across those states that do address credit recovery, there are some key policy components that emerge. And also, as I was looking at state policy, something that not necessarily says you must have this in place, but common sense would dictate that uh, students will be more likely to have broad access to high quality credit recovery programs that not only help them pass that course, but set them up for success in the subsequent course in that discipline if you have certain components in place. And so there's a report I did back in 2011 before this wonderful research was published that looked at credit recovery policies in the states and then set forward some of those ideas for best practices. And in the interest of time, I won't go through every one of these seven or so bullets. We can revisit these during the Q&A, but, but Madam President, if you'd like me to address any of these at the present time, I can. These are all addressed in the report that was published back in 2011. So looking at um, some of the more robust statewide credit recovery policies, um, there are some questions to consider that emerge. Um, some states require that before a student may enroll in a credit recovery program, the parent or guardian must grant consent. And I, this is, of course, to let parents know your student not only has failed this course, but there is an alternative opportunity for the student to earn credit in a course perhaps required for high school graduation. Um, some states specify in, sp in policy that a student must have previously taken and failed the course before the student is eligible for credit recovery for two reasons. It sounds as though in another um, high school in this district, um, students were taking credit recovery prior to taking the regular course. In other states, it appears that um, students were taking credit recovery um, to improve their grade in that course, to potentially improve their GPA. I got a D instead of an F in this course, but I want to get a C. Can I take for credit recovery and get a C instead? A question, another question is an attendance requirement. If the course is pace, student paced rather than uh, throughout a semester, what does the attendance requirement look like, um, particularly perhaps if the course is delivered online or through a hybrid model? And then in some states, uh, Tennessee in particular, they mentioned that a student must have mastered X percent of the course content before being eligible to enroll in a credit recovery. In Tennessee, it's 50 percent. If a student has mastered less than 50 percent of the course content as measured by the end of course exam, that student must re-enroll in the course rather than go through the credit recovery option. So other questions to consider in terms of instruction, trying to balance, to calibrate that um, challenge between offering uh, courses that are led by a certified instructor in that um, discipline versus um, broad access to meet perhaps need student need. So these first two questions um, are related to that. If the course is delivered either um, via software or online or some hybrid thereof, must the course be facilitated by either a certified teacher in that discipline or a certified teacher period, or perhaps could a parent professional or some other skilled, um, trained adult um, lead that course? If the course on the second bullet is delivered face to face, uh, must it be taught by an instructor endorsed in the credit recovery subject area? And then I think this one is pretty, uh, uh, to me the answer is clear, but um, must the, the course be aligned with state content standards? And I would argue yes. 
And then lastly, what type of training must be provided for the credit recovery teacher or the facilitator? It was said mentor in the um, previous speaker's uh, presentation, but these two, looking at the two levels of um, instructional support for students in credit recovery. So pivoting to Tennessee, which I believe has the most robust state policies on credit recovery, uh, the first level of instructional guidance and support is for a teacher of record who is a teacher who is uh, credentialed in the subject of the credit recovery course. The, uh, teacher of record, every student is assigned to a, a teacher of record in a credit recovery course, has a few tasks assigned in state policy. One is to look at the individual student diagnostic results. What were the standards where that student fell short in the original taking of that course? And what are the appropriate goals coursework tasks for that student to address those um, deficits after from that original course. The, t the teacher of record then works closely with the credit recovery facilitators, those folks who are with the students day in and day out on delivering that content and instruction. And then finally, at the end of the uh, intervention, looking at the final student's coursework to see whether they or not they have met the standards that they didn't meet during the original course. And then the, the next level below that in Tennessee policy is a facilitator, a person who delivers day-to-day -day oversight of the credit recovery program under the guidance of this um, teacher of record. The credit recovery facilitator by policy is required to receive training on credit recovery course organization, online instructional management, and related technology. And when it says online instructional management, that doesn't necessarily mean that all courses in Tennessee are delivered online or through software, but uh, just to make sure that that um, support is there if that course is being delivered through those methods. And then other questions to consider. Obviously, credit recovery can impact students' um, course grades, their GPA. So when a student completes a course via credit recovery, what sort of course grade does that student receive? Is that um, course factored into their uh, a final GPA? Is it listed on their transcript? Does the transcript indicate that students completed a course via credit recovery? And so going back to Tennessee where all of these are addressed in policy, one of the few states that does address this is that students who uh, pass the credit recovery course receive a 70% course grade. The transcript does indicate that student completed a course via credit recovery. The uh, original failing grade may but is not required to be listed on the transcript but that originating failing grade is not listed or is not factored into the student's final GPA. And so those are my prepared remarks. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you both. I'm sure they have plenty of questions. This time I'll start at this end and work out. Me? Great. Thank you both um, for this testimony. It's very interesting. Um, let's see. I think I'd like to start. Um, First with, um, I forget your name, sorry, American uh, Research Institutes, and I don't have my agenda right in front of me. But so if I understand it correctly, the study that you conducted, and I understand randomized control trials and all of the controls for that, are you saying it reached the level of randomized control trial in terms of how you held constant both groups to make sure they were comparable? Yes, that, that's correct. We, we used a randomization or a lottery process. Okay. Some kids went into the online course and some went into the face-to-face -face course. Um, okay. One, just to maybe clarify slightly though, we don't necessarily attribute the, the differences of the effects specifically to the, the mode of instruction, so online versus face-to-face, -face, but kind of everything that comes with being in the online class uh, yeah. versus the face-to-face -face class. But yes, in terms of the, a randomized controlled trial, that, that's how it was set up. Okay, and so you're, you're, it was hard for me to understand the big conclusions from your presentation. Do I understand it correctly that when you, when you were talking about you, when you have to go back and teach fractions, you lose valuable course time that is necessary to also help the child understand algebra. Were you saying that if the, if the groups were, were truly random, there would be an equal number in each group, more or less, who didn't understand fractions before entering the algebra course, right? Yeah, that's correct. Um, one of the things, hopefully this clear, this yeah. kind of, one of the things we found was that in the face-to-face -face class where the teacher is kind of directing instruction, um, the instruction went back to kind of more pre-algebra type okay. content, whereas in the online class, it was programmed in in the online course to specifically focus on second semester algebra. And so students didn't necessarily have that opportunity 
to go back and, Got and it. kind of relearn material they hadn't learned in okay. previous courses. And so do you know of other studies that are out there that are of similar rigor to this one that might have used an adaptive test that goes back and reissues re content or even Khan Academy? Or then there are a number of ways that students can access remedial lessons through online instruction that might account for that in a, like, in a computer based and a live right, person. Right. Um, so uh, we are not aware of any kind of of that high rigor uh, of study that's been conducted so far. Um, and I would say the you know this study is, is a little bit old now, and these online programs are definitely adapting and evolving. Um, so you know, I'm guessing a, a number of the of the online programs now have the, that functionality to, to kind of go back and provide um, okay content that wasn't covered. Thank you, Dr. Rickles. I'm sorry for not saying your name earlier. And um, Madam President, I would like to have more time later on. Thanks. Thank you both for being here and for your really terrific and informative testimony. It's incredibly helpful. Uh, thank you so much, um, Ms. Zinth, for stressing the Tennessee model. Uh, we're going to rely heavily on our superintendent, since I believe that's where she came from. <laughs> um, I just want to uh, highlight one piece, uh, Dr. Rickles, that you brought up, but that um, Ms. Zinth expanded upon, which is it's only appropriate to provide credit recovery, quote, after a student has failed it. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? And that seems like the right definition for credit <laughs> recovery. Yeah. Terrific. I, I think we've had some trouble with that definition here in Washington, so we really appreciate the clarification and reiteration of that. Um, what's the appropriate role, and this is probably more for you, Ms. Zinth, but certainly, Dr. Rickles, you can chime in. What's the appropriate role of a state education agency in creating a policy, since so few states do have policies around credit recovery? Um, I would say that it would be setting a definition of credit recovery and clearly stating the um, intended aim of credit recovery and Tennessee policy, I'm trying to remember it off the top of my head, but they say to provide instruction to students who have failed the course in order to deliver instruction. I can go back and provide the rule after this meeting, um, but they've set a, the, the, the definition, mission, and then set forth some of the key components I described in terms of instructor qualifications, how students are identified for the course, as well as the parental role in signing off to say that this is an acceptable option for my child. And then also the, the grading practices. There's another area, I believe, in Tennessee policy that I did not mention in this presentation, and it's failing me right now, but setting those broad parameters so everyone's on the same page on um, ensuring instructional quality and uh, student outcomes. Anything to add, Dr. Rickles? No, no. I'd default um, to yeah. Great. And then my final question, uh, and probably again, Ms. Zinth, but certainly Dr. Rickles chime in, um, is is it a best practice for an LEA to um, conduct self-oversight for something of this nature, or should there be an independent body that ensures that LEAs are complying with uh, state policies on credit recovery? Yes. If I'm not mistaken, the Tennessee policy says that the department will monitor um, implementation and evaluate programs. Um, I think that's probably the appropriate So it's role. probably not appropriate for LEAs to self <laughs> uh, have self-oversight. Perhaps only in the sense of how many students passed versus failed the credit recovery intervention and what happened to those students who failed, did they retake the entire course, and what have been the success of students who did pass the credit recovery in subsequent courses in the subject area. Thank you. That's helpful. Our, our oversight system in D.C. is broken down, and we need to make some real changes to make sure that we're not, we're not uh, abusing students and abusing policies that are in place. Thank you so much. So I'll start with uh, Mr. Rickles. Um, so your comparison is between um, students who failed the original course and then got assigned either to the online or the in-class, uh, I'm sorry, the online or the blended version, or the, on the online or the face-to-face -face version. And the face-to-face -face version, as I understand, it's not a class, it's your, or is it a class? How, the face-to-face -face would kind of be what you'd think of as a standard, typical so algebra it is just one a class. retake. It's a retake of the right, class, right? Complete. So, so my question was going to be: you you made that comparison, but did 
did you compare how the students in those two um, options did compared to uh, sort of what they would have learned in a regular class? But I guess what you're saying is that it really is that comparison. So the face-to-face, -face, it was the same number of hours, it was the same curriculum, it was the same teacher, it was, so it's, it's just the two things. Yeah, I think with the, the caveat there that it is a summer school, so it's kind of how, how, what students would take if they were taking, retaking the course in, over the summer. Um, but so that'll, that'll just differ from school to school and, dist and probably teacher to teacher, um, okay. how much that summer school course looks like a, a standard school okay. year course. Yeah. All right. So a question for both of you. I think one of the big issues here was uh, or is a sense that credit recovery was used so liberally that it was, there was almost a disincentive for students to go to their regular classes. Um, and I wonder um, how, how you would think about that. Obviously, Tennessee has in place a few things that would seem to disincentivize it, at least for some students. Like, if I understand that you can only get a, a C in the class. Um, that's correct. And I assume that's the purpose of that. Yes, I, I, I would assume that that is the purpose, yes. Do you, have, do you have anything else to say about this issue that, to the extent that we make it easier to get into it, um, it can be an incentive not to go to the regular class and that can be a, a problem? Or the only other thing I can think of is that, I don't remember if it was Tennessee policy or another state's policy that um, requires parents to be and students to be notified that uh, many credit recovery classes are not recognized by NCAA um, or may not be recognized by a college or university upon post-secondary admissions. And so if a student is planning to go to college or participate in NCAA sports, um, this could again serve as a disincentive to participate in credit recovery. So in my last two seconds, Oh my, 20, 19 seconds. So what's the NCAA reason for not allowing students to take it? They think it's in, I mean, do they have evidence that says it's a worse education than it's a? I do not know. Okay. All right. Well, th there are some credit recovery courses that are NCAA approved. I think it just will differ from yeah, not model to model uh -huh. and course to okay. course. Okay. I'll do another round later. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you for joining us. I just had one quick question. I, I think um, as much uh, conversation as we've had about credit recovery over the past few months in D.C., we've also had about attendance. Um, and I think it was mentioned earlier that, that depending on, on what policy it is, that students who fail a course because of attendance issues and not necessarily because of academic performance might be um, excluded from using the credit recovery. Is, is there um, kind of a general standard across the country for jurisdictions that have this? Um, and, and I ask this because especially for students who you know may have housing instability or any extenuating circumstance that prevents them from coming to school um, who may be excluded from from an opportunity like this is there any kind of baseline or standard that you see and are there any recommendations you might have um, there are only two policies I can think of off the top of my head that address uh, attendance within credit recovery Louisiana uh, specifically says that um, attendance shall not be monitored for a credit recovery course, and I don't entirely understand the reasoning for that. I can only hypothesize that that's because they're thinking it's a student self-paced course, and why should I sit through a semester if I only missed a few number of standards to fail the course, or to, you know, I mean, um, Tennessee policy says that there are various areas that LEAs may adopt policies that go above and beyond the state policy and attendance is one of those areas of policy. But as I mentioned earlier, um, st most state policies, if they exist at all, are pretty thin on credit recovery, and so attendance is one of the issues that most pi policies on credit recovery are silent on. I just have one question. I'm a little confused, and excuse me if I am. I credit recovery and uh, a summer school class program, they're two different things. Am I right? The credit recovery, they, they're not necessarily going through the whole course, but they're only taking or dealing with the areas that they failed within that class? So in this instance, um, they are essentially taking the whole semester course within the summer uh, school 
of time that's allotted. So it's about, I believe, 60 hours of instruction over the summer. And that was essentially the same setup in this case for the online class as well. So are we using the terminology credit recovery for summer school? When it com or because most, a lot of children take classes in summer school because they failed a course during the school year. So uh, is it, I'm not quite understanding. So the way the city has implemented it is sometimes during the summer, but often students are given credit recovery to a credit recovery course at the same time as they would be taking regular courses during the school year mm. or after school. to try to make up credits. Thank you. And it might in some cases not even be a course they had enrolled in prior. Wow. Thank yeah. you. Can I go again? Okay, great. Um, I'm going to ask a really quick question to Dr. Rickolds. So to understand the long-term results of the study, what I'm reading into this is that the students who got, uh, did not pass the online course and therefore did not recover that credit somehow got the credit elsewhere because they graduated at the same rate as the students who had the face-to-face -face course. Is that correct? So, well, there's kind of two, two sides of that coin, actually. But um, th remember, we, we, this study was students taking it in the summer between their ninth and 10th grade year. So they had multiple years to make it up, make later. It up um, by the end. The other, other way to think about that is the students, even some students that passed the course in their in the face-to-face -face version and in the, in the online class, ran into some other barrier on their pathway to graduation. Okay, thank you. And then for both of you, but potentially Ms. Zinth, starting with you, um, when you think about what you know about competency-based education and its correlation or lack thereof to credit recovery, I mean, really, the two could be aligned in, in, in districts that decide to take a more competency-based approach to education. Um, they wouldn't need credit recovery because students are going at their own pace and demonstrating mastery along the way, right? That's correct. So if a student was struggling in algebra, they could take a year and a half instead of a year to complete algebra one. Or if there was a certain concept within algebra one that they were struggling with, they could take a little bit more time to get through that unit, but then uh, move at a faster pace through the remainder of the uh, course, the semester of the year. And are you aware of any states um, I'm aware of what's happening in New Hampshire in terms of their uh, adoption of essentially all competency-based education. But are you aware of any states that are knocking it out of the park in this area yet in terms of competency-based education, which would enable students to progress at their own pace, learn in their own environment in most cases, demonstrate what they know versus being held to a set of, of, um, of learning practices that are the same for all students in many cases? especially in an urban district? Yeah, there are three other states that have either, in a, either move, have moved or are in the process of moving to a competency-based model. They also happen to be in New England, uh, Vermont, Maine, and um, what's the other state? Rhode Island. And so in Rhode Island, and I believe this is already uh, in implementation for you know this year's seniors, um, st when you look at the um, regulations establishing graduation requirements, it looks like Carnegie units. It says four courses of English, three courses of math, and so on. But then we read further into the regulation, it says that an LEA determines the standards that a student must attain in order to complete the course and the measures by which the student is assessed to, to assert, assert that that student has completed the course. And um, so if a student maybe is in um, ninth grade English and uh, it's taking them more than a year to complete English 9, then they, I guess, as I understand it, continue progressing until they can complete that assessment, be it performance-based, be it traditional pencil and paper assessment, uh, to demonstrate those standards that are tied to that particular course. Um, Maine and Vermont are looking at uh, more, l not calling it courses or credits in regulation, but saying that you must master um, English standards, math standards, social studies, science standards by the time you graduate, and not even tying a number next to the standards that are tied to those um, subject areas. And so in, Mass uh, in Maine, um, they're working with it now, and I think it's first going into effect with a class of 2021 or 
2021. And so there are four subject areas, English science, math, social studies, where students must have you know, mastered the standards to graduate. And then with each successive graduating class going to the class of 2025, uh, students must complete one additional subject areas. They have subject areas or su standards in eight uh, areas, and I, I think it's self-directed, so if a student is really great in foreign language, that could be their fifth subject area for the following school year in Vermont. They have, <coughs> excuse me, seven subject areas that they have standards for, and one of which is called transferable skills, these, you know, employability skills, soft skills, what have you. And effective with the class of 2020, students are to have attained the standards in all seven of those as determined by the LEA in order to graduate. Um, but I have to say there, there are some bumps on the road for each of those as they've gone through the implementation process. And are, are either of you aware of any um, non-examination test demonstration of credit recovery that's been permitted by states? Uh, offhand, I, I can't think of any. That, that may be something because there's some so few state policies that are left to local purview. Thank you. So, Ms. Zinth, just a quick clarification, and and thank you for the briefing document you provided to us. Uh, that I think is available on the state board's website. On the Tennessee model, um, under policy implications, uh, uh, under admission and removal uh, number four. It, this document states that local boards of education shall track and designate students enrolled in credit recovery courses as directed by the Tennessee Department of Education. And this just follows up on our previous discussion. So when we have a situation as, as unique as DC is where our um, executive, our chancellor, as also our legislative, our chancellor, and we don't have an independent school board, how do we ensure fidelity to um, a state policy? That's an excellent question. Um, the best solution that I can offer offhand would be um, monitoring um, enrollment, uh, as I mentioned in my earlier response. Year to year, if a student was enrolled in a credit recovery um, intervention in this spring school year, uh, monitoring where is that student, let's say it was for Algebra 1, if that student, where is that student in math uh, in fall of 2018? And if we're seeing a pattern of uh, students repeating a credit recovery intervention or failing in the following semester's course in that subject area than intervening with that LEA. Thank you, that's helpful. Anything to, to add? Oh, um, no, as a researcher, I, I fully endorse the <laughs> idea of well, great. collecting we, the data and, and following it. Yeah. We'll have to look for opportunities <laughs> to work with our um, state education ad agency who controls data to um, ensure fidelity. Thank you. Um, so my question in a way is a follow-up to both of these previous ones and maybe I'm confused and not understanding something but how do you know um, that at the end of the credit recovery course the material has been learned and the extent to which it's been learned comparable to another class now I know your study is really just summer school so I'm kind of interested in it but maybe less interested in it because it really is it sounds like that example, it's just uh, they're both going through the same course and I don't know if there's a test at the end of it, but how, how, how do you know at the end of these credit recovery courses that kids have learned the material or not, other than, as you say, will you wait a few years and find out that they're failing again? Of course, if the next course they take doesn't have a very rigorous standard and people are being encouraged to just pass kids, you'll never know they'll just pass and pass and pass and graduate. So how do we know? How do you know? Yeah, Tennessee and some of the other states that have more robust uh, credit recovery policies have end of course assessments in core subjects for high school graduation. And so my guess is that in Tennessee and some of these other states, the student takes the end of course exam and based on the outcome of that exam, we know whether the student has mastered this subject area. And if the the course is one that student has failed that doesn't have a state end of course exam. Perhaps the student takes the teacher's final exam and we see if that student has mastered the subject area or not. You're saying perhaps or that is what they do? We don't. The, since the policy doesn't speak to that, it's, it's one, my guess is what's happening at the school or district level. But, my, but in Tennessee, I would, I would say with almost certainty that the student takes the state level end of course exam if, that's, if the state has a, an end of course exam in that subject area. 
and otherwise you think they're probably taking the teachers that the teachers student would take the, the final exam that the student probably failed in the first taking of that course and in other credit recovery programs that you're familiar with do you have anything to say about this or, or really you're saying you know about Tennessee and you know about this experiment and that's really what we're we're talking about today yeah. policy is mostly silent on this issue on the, on the issue of how the student demonstrates mastery, uh -huh. the policy will say that a student should demonstrate mastery, but how the student does that is not dictated in poli state policy. And, and in, in our case, the study in our case, for the official grade, it was left up to the teacher, which would be kind of the common practice in, in any course, in, right. unless there is an official end of course exam. So, okay, so I just wanna note, for me, that's a really, that's an important issue is how are we gonna know at the end of it that kids have reached a certain standard, wh whatever that is, and that is comparable to the classroom, because otherwise I'm afraid we, one, continue to incentivize kids not to go to the class, but to do something easier and separate, and that they go on and don't know the work. And I have one other very quick question, which is, do any of these programs use unit recovery? Is that part of what, or it's all class, full class recovery? Uh, I haven't seen anything to okay. that effect. All right, thank you. Go quickly. Okay. Just really quickly, we don't know what the long-term impact was of the Tennessee policy, do we, in any way? Uh, I haven't seen a study that says if of the X number of students who completed a credit recovery intervention, X students graduated from high school or succeeded in subsequent courses in the same discipline and so on. I, I can look on the Tennessee Department of Ed website to see if such a study has been conducted, but I don't know offhand of one. All right. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Very interesting discussion, and thank you for bringing us that information. Seeing no additional questions, um, when, with no further business before the board, I would like to entertain a motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. Second. Therefore, the ayes have it in this public meeting of the. Oh, all in favor? Aye. All Aye. opposed? Um, the ayes have it in this public meeting of the District of Columbia State Board of Education is adjourned at 7.35 p.m. <laughs>